In chapter eight, we will learn how to identify microorganisms strictly by their metabolism. Metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions in a cell. This includes the building up or breaking down of complex molecules through a series of chemical reactions called metabolic pathways. There are two types of reactions, exergonic and endergonic. Exergonic reactions are catabolic. They release energy when large molecules are broken down to smaller molecules. Endergonic reactions are anabolic, meaning they use energy to assemble small molecules into larger molecules. But where does this carbon come from? It comes from food sources. We categorize nutrient and energy exchange by studying the trophic characteristics of organisms. Troph is from the Greek word trophos, meaning to obtain food. Organisms can be identified based on how they get their carbon. There are two types of carbon eaters, autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotrophs convert inorganic carbon dioxide to carbon compounds. Heterotrophs get carbon compounds from the autotrophs they consume. We can also identify organisms by their energy source. All energy comes from the transfer of electrons, but the source of the electrons varies between organisms. Phototrophs get their energy for electron transfer from light sources. Chemotrophs get their energy for electron transfer by breaking bonds. We can further classify organisms by combining these two classifications. That way we know at once where they get their carbon from and how they convert their energy. This is summarized in table 8.1 in your OpenStax textbook. You see we have chemoautotrophs and chemoheterotrophs. These are organisms that gain their energy from breaking carbon compounds. Chemoautotrophs receive their carbon from inorganic compounds and chemoheterotrophs receive their carbon from autotrophs. The same with photoautotrophs and photoheterotrophs. Both receive their energy from light, but photoautotrophs receive their carbon from inorganic compounds and photoheterotrophs receive their carbon from autotrophs. Let's talk a little bit more about electron transfer. Transferring energy via electrons allows for the release of small amounts of energy at a time. This helps organisms conserve energy. Electron transfer happens through chemical reactions. There are two types of electron transfer reactions, oxidation and reduction. Oxidation reactions remove electrons from donor molecules, leaving them oxidized. Reduction reactions add electrons to acceptor molecules, leaving them reduced. Here in this oxidation reaction, we see the hydroxyl molecule donating a hydrogen electron, leaving only an oxygen. Here we see an electron from hydrogen is added to the hydroxyl group in this reduction reaction to create water. Here is a more sophisticated example. On the left side of the equation, we have CH4 methane and hydrogen. On the right side of this balanced equation, we have carbon dioxide and water. For the oxidation reaction, the carbon atom loses its hydrogen electrons. For the reduction reaction, the hydrogen gains oxygen electrons. Because we know science exists in equilibrium, oxidation and reduction occur simultaneously. Instead of saying that this is an oxidation reduction reaction, these paired reactions are called redox reactions. One mnemonic that helped me remember this in college is oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. Now what happens to the energy released by these electron transfer reactions? This energy can be stored by electron carriers or stored in the bonds of adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Electron carriers bind and move high energy electrons between compounds in pathways. For this class, we will focus on the rock stars of electron carriers, B vitamin byproducts. nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, and flavin adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, NADP, and FAD. NAD, ADP, and FAD can easily be oxidized or reduced. 
Look at these pairs. Do you see which form of the electron carrier has an electron to donate? Based just on what you see here, which forms of these carriers is oxidized? Did you answer NAD, NADP, and FAD? They each have the plus sign there indicating that they have an electron to donate, therefore they are oxidized. NADH, NADPH, and FADH2 are electron receivers, so they are the reducing forms of the electron carriers. We can say they have reducing power. NAD and FAD play a role in catabolic reactions, meaning they break bonds to extract sugar from larger molecules. NAD, NADH is the most common electron carrier used in catabolism. NADP participates in anabolic photosynthetic reactions, building sugars from smaller molecules in light reactions. Another effective way cells can store energy is through adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. ATP is actually built up from adenosine monophosphate, or AMP. AMP only has one phosphate group bonded to the adenosine. AMP is phosphorylated, which means phosphate groups are added on to become ATP, which has three phosphates. When the cell needs energy, these phosphate bonds can be broken and phosphate groups are removed. Here we see ATP losing a phosphate group to become ADP. Losing a phosphate group is called dephosphorylation. Recall that we know about two types of reactions, endergonic and exergonic. When AMP is being phosphorylated or adding phosphate groups to become ATP, this requires energy. What kind of reaction is that, endergonic or exergonic? When ATP is dephosphorylated to become ADP and AMP, energy is released. What kind of reaction is that? When AMP is phosphorylated to become ATP, this is an endergonic reaction. When ATP is dephosphorylated to become ADP and AMP, these are exergonic reactions. We'll finish up this little lesson by discussing enzyme structure and function. Cells have activation energy. Activation energy is the energy needed to form or break chemical bonds and convert reactants to products. Enzymes lower activation energy. This gives the molecules the time they need to meet each other and stick together long enough to form a complex. Because of this, we call enzymes catalysts. A catalyst speeds up a reaction. Here we see an enzyme at work. The enzyme binds its chemical reaction partner, which we call a substrate. You can see in step one that the enzyme and substrate have what we call specificity. This means that for each enzyme, there is a substrate that fits the unique shape of the enzyme's active site. In step two, the enzyme and substrate have formed a complex, which causes a slight change in shape or conformational change in the enzyme to lock the substrate in. Then shown here in step three, Chemical reactions occur and the substrate reactants are converted to products. Then we see in step four, the products are released from the enzyme. Enzyme substrate reactions are tricky. They have to have a perfect environment to be active. The pH, temperature, substrate concentrations, and cofactors and coenzymes have to be perfect for the active site to welcome the substrate. Sometimes chemical reactions are prevented from occurring. In the left panel, a competitive inhibitor blocks the active site, preventing the substrate from binding. This is called competitive inhibition. Sometimes the inhibitor binds at what's called an allosteric site. The allosteric site is a non-active site, but when the in inhibitor is here, it causes a conformational change at the active site so that the substrate no longer fits and cannot form a complex with the enzyme. 